Hi, everyone. Dr. Elizabeth Bonet here. Dr. Liz, welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Before we jump in, please note that the podcast is not mental health treatment, nor should it replace mental health treatment. If you need psychotherapy or hypnotherapy, please seek treatment from a trained professional. I do hypnosis all over the world, so please feel free to contact me through my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. Hi listeners, Dr. Liz here. This interview with Hunter Clark Fields includes a lot of laughter (laughs) because of course we're talking about parenting and I think you always have to have a lot of laughter if you're going to talk about parenting, right? Parenting can get pretty heavy for most of us. So we break it up and I try to ask what I call like the stupidest questions. (laughs) She gives a good grounding exercise in it. We talk about how to bring awareness to a moment earlier than when perhaps a conflict has already escalated, how to build your calm muscle, and also whether she believes it's more difficult to parent if someone's a highly sensitive person. So I ask that question and get her take on it. Hunter Clark Fields is a mindful mama mentor. She is the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, host of the Mindful Mama podcast, and widely followed author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. So she has over 20 years of experience in meditation practices and teaching mindfulness. Her writing has appeared in CNBC, NBC, The Huffington Post, Tiny Buddha, Mops, Elephant Journal, Mothering. I'm sure she has a lot more credits than that. But she's also the mother of two very active daughters who are now 11 and 14 at the airing time. So I hope you enjoy this interview and it helps you some with your own parenting, no matter what age your kids are. Peace. Hi, Hunter. Welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I am excited to jump in to um, questions about your new book, Raising Good Humans. I really love the title. And I think it's, um, you know, it's a goal of many parents to raise a good human, right? Like that's what we yeah. think about <laughs> as well as, as well as all kinds of other stuff. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, my ex-husband said to me just the other day, I have a 15 year old and a 19 um, year old. And the 15 year old is struggling because of COVID and online school and all kinds of stuff. And he said, look, Eva, I just want you to be a good person and a happy person. Like that's exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I was like, oh, you know, it was actually really sweet. Um, Yeah. So I really love the title. Thanks. So I want to do a little bit of background here for my listeners. How did you originally come across the concept of mindfulness. And can you also tell them um, your kids and how old they are and all the good stuff? Sure. Yeah. My kids are uh, having a snow day today. They're so excited. (laughs) They are awesome. About to turn 14 and about to turn 11. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're in the thick of that, that adolescent (laughs) experience. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I, I discovered mindfulness when I was a teenager actually. And I, I've always been this really highly sensitive person, you know, it's just kind of who I am as a highly sensitive person. And, um, I didn't really recognize it in those terms at the time, but I, I, you know, I'd always struggled with like falling into these sort of pits and, Um, yeah, I would, when I was up, I was up, but when I was down, I was really down. Um, and I I remember my father actually describing it to me after I'd been crying. He said, this is your artistic temperament and this is just how life is going to be. And I was like, great. Okay. Thanks. Wow. (laughs) This is like (laughs) hopeful. Hopeful. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, uh, and so I started to read about, um, mindfulness as a teenager and just like reading the books brought me so much relief 
Mm-hmm. And that was really helpful for a while. And uh, and then finally, I was able to actually <laughs> sit down and practice. T- after 10 years of reading books, I actually was able to um, sit down and do my own meditation practice. I had done a yoga teacher training and I came home. I said, okay, if I could sit in meditation for 30 minutes that one day, I can do 10 minutes every day. And so I did lo and behold, it was a, a much more effective to actually do it than just read about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was interesting. Like I, I really remember being about two or three months in and, um, and, and thinking that the whole thing wasn't working. Like I'm just sitting here thinking the whole time, like I'm not even mm-hmm. doing this correctly. You know, all these thoughts that we have because it's hard for everybody. But at the time I didn't really know that. And so, Uh, But I looked back at the rest of my life outside of the meditation practice, and I realized that I hadn't fallen into the pits that I had fallen into for 27 years of my life up until that point. Mm. And that was huge. I mean, that was just such a huge game changer for me. And I was like, oh, yes, you know, I was on board. (laughs) Yeah. So so it, it really was a big transformer in my own life. Very cool. Very cool. Did you end up teaching yoga? Yeah, I did. I taught yoga awesome. for many years. Actually, it was just I, up and with the pandemic <clears throat> that I stopped teaching this, you know, a, at least a one class on a weeknight, you know. Uh, oh, so you still teach, basically. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it, I, no. Had been, <laughs> I had been considering stopping um, because mm-hmm. just my other work with uh, mindful parenting and doing the work that I do now, it just takes up that much time. And also my kids are at the age where I want to be home in the evenings. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's yeah. not like something you don't teach yoga, you know, for the income it's generating. You teach yoga for the experience and it's a wonderful experience, but I want to be with my kids on the weeknights. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's funny because I remember um, when I first had my first daughter and she was a baby and I had this neighbor who had teenagers, early teens. And she said to me, like, it is even more important to be home when they are teenagers than when they're little. And I still remember her saying that. And um, and it is, it's like, as they age, we sort of think, oh, you know, we can do a lot more. We can work in the afternoons, you know, we don't have to be home. <laughs> you know, it is a lecture to, to be able to be home with them when they get out of school or in the evenings. But I feel the same way. Like it is important now. And like you, I taught in the evenings prenatal yoga for uh, Monday, Wednesday evenings for years and years and years, like you know, 15, 18 years, right? Mm-hmm. 18 years. And then eventually, like we're, I was telling you earlier, sold that company. But part of it is like, yeah, I want to be home with my kids. You know, oh. and originally it was somewhat of an escape for me. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Like and you're, it was you're... hard. <laughs> yeah. And I was home with them all day for many years. You know, yeah. I was like, see ya. I have to go teach yoga. You know, like, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to go spend time with other adults who are interested in being calm and having this yes. like embodied experience. Like, sorry, bye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, no, exactly. I, I can really see with my daughters about to turn 14. Like, 18 and too far away. Like, um, yeah. do you know, it's, and how fast, of course, it's gone by those 14 years are like, what, what happened? So, you know, I, I want to be here as much as I can. Absolutely. So how did you come up with this book? Well, the book is based on my curriculum for mindful parenting. And that came about because I was really frustrated. I mean, the whole thing came about because I was really frustrated as a young parent. Um, I, you know, when my oldest daughter was like 18 months to two years old, she started talking back to me and I started like Mm -hmm. getting this, this temper just arose out of me that was just ferocious. And she was, it's funny because you look back and she's so cute then. (laughs) Like, oh my Uh gosh, I had this like raging temper. And it's just, you know, it was my father's temper. It's patterns, generational patterns that are passed on. And I could really see those patterns. You know, I could see like, oh, this is my father's temper and I could, all of this stuff. So I really realized, you know, I'd been, I dove into a lot of learning about how to parent more effectively and more compassionately Mm -hmm. and all of these things. But I really realized that 
this thing was missing at that point, you know, like, so there are all, there are wonderful, so many wonderful people who teach so many wonderful things like, you know, about how to communicate effectively with little kids and they're amazing and they're really missing this really important piece, which is how to do that when you're triggered and when you're reactive, yes. right? Like how that, to calm yourself down to do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and literally we're like missing, you know, when our stress response is triggered, we're like literally not accessing all the parts of our brain, especially the parts of our brain that take a little longer to process like higher order thinking and problem solving and empathy and all of these things in the, you know, potentially later evolved prefrontal cortex behind our forehead part of the brain, like that's like cut off Mm -hmm. completely when you're reactive. So I was very frustrated because I'm like learning these things and I, it wouldn't come out of my mouth when (laughs) I was reactive. So I really saw that the mindfulness that I had been studying and reading about for so long was, this was really an important piece here that Mm -hmm. And I started to dive into it even deeper and just to learn about, you know, and and the science behind it, the neuroscience and, and how, you know, one without the other was not enough kind of. And it was interesting because as I looked into it in the mindfulness community, there people were teaching um, what they called mindful parenting, but really is mindfulness for parents, which is Mm -hmm. like kind of the ideas if you, if you practice mindfulness and you calm your reactivity as you study the heart, then everything will be fine after that. Mm -hmm. But the truth is like you can calm down and then some crappy thing your parents might have said will still come out of your mouth if you're not also studying the communication skills. So what I realized is that, you know, mindfulness and skillful communication had to come together. And that's really what I contribute to this conversation is bringing them both together. I bring them both together in my mindful parenting course and membership, and I bring them both together in the book and raising good humans. Mm, Yeah, I love that. That is really, like, it's a really good description of what happens, right? It's like we can read and read and read and know all these different skills. And then they sort of go out the window in the moment if someone's triggered. So it's like working on how do I calm down? How do I not be triggered? How do I um, move into this mind space to where I'm less reactive? I can pause. I can be you know, what they call mindful, right? In the moment in terms of, and with like a a toddler or even a little (laughs) sitting right in front of me, like not holding it together at all, because that's not what they do at that age. (laughs) They're not expected to hold it together. (laughs) You know, Um, someone who's like um, this tiny little human being who's melting down. Now, what do I do? Yeah. I hear you. So I'd love how in the book you give these practical exercises for people to do. And perhaps you could give one on the podcast today. Um, not the raisin one, I'm going to say, okay. <laughs> no, no, like no <laughs> not the raisins. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> it's funny. I was talking to my husband last night about the interview and I was like, you know, I, I would like for her to do a mindful exercise, but not the raisin. Like there's not another raisin <laughs> I can eat on the planet mindfully, you know, <laughs> tasting the texture and like, you know, <laughs> working it around my mouth. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's so funny um yeah it's uh but it's so effective it's such an effective like uh, <laughs> difference yes. from the way that we normally eat things right I think that's why it's such a like powerful first introduction to like oh look how different this is you know and uh, yes and mm-hmm. it's funny I've done the raisin exercise because I I do like uh I do a, a mindful parenting teacher training. And so they Mm. teach the ranges and exercise back to me. And I'm really surprised that like every time I do the raisin exercise, I I get more intimate with the raisin. Oh, (laughs) very nice. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. What is something that a parent could practice that you feel like would be like in the moment really good for them later? Well, I think something that's really helpful and and is just so helpful for us in so many ways, especially as we, you know, we all go through a pandemic, et cetera, is like grounding exercise, like really just Mm -hmm. helping yourself to ground. Um, You you know, mindfulness is is the power of our attention, right? Like we're replacing our attention on a specific thing, the present moment with an attitude of kindness and compassion. 
and curiosity. And so we're bringing this curiosity and this attention to something in the present moment. And, and that can be a lot of things. And sometimes, you know, if we're bringing our attention in the present moment to like what's really difficult or maybe what's, you know, challenging in front of us, it can be overwhelming. So Mm -hmm. instead we can practice to bring our attention to what is steadying in the moment. Right. And so If you're standing on the ground, if you're sitting in a chair or sitting on the ground, you can feel that touch, right? Like you can feel that touch as I speak about it right now, wherever you're touching the earth, you can feel that sense of touch, right? Whether it's in your seat Mm -hmm. or your feet, and you can just feel that pressure, right? And as we ground, as we feel into that pressure, we can feel the sense of gravity holding us to the earth. You know, we can start to breathe a little slower, Mm -hmm. Just let ourselves rest with that sense of touch. And as we sit with that, that sense of touch, there's actually even a little, um, a little saying, a little gatha that I learned from the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh that I think is really helpful. And as you breathe in, you say to yourself, breathing in, I am like a mountain. Mm Mm-hmm. And breathing out, I feel solid. Mm, Beautiful. And then so you just breathe in mountain. Breathe out solid. And you can even put your hands on, you know, maybe you're at a desk. You put your hands on the desk or you put your hands on the floor and just feel that sense of grounding, that sense of connection. And it it can be a very short amount of time where we feel this sense of grounding. And this is what the Buddha did, or before he was the Buddha, he, he sat down and he was determined to become enlightened and to wake up from suffering. And so one of the first things he did is he, he got nourishment from a, a local woman, a girl gave him nourishment, uh, like, I think it was milk or something. And mm-hmm. then he, and right before he achieved enlightenment, he was assailed by our most challenging obstacle to, to waking up and being present, which is doubt and doubt came along and doubt was the most challenging obstacle there is. And, and what the Buddha did is he reached down and he touched the earth. And that's what we're doing right now for putting our hands on the earth and putting our feet on the earth is that we're reaching down and we're connecting with the solidity of the earth. Mm -hmm. And we're asking our really our original mother for, support right and we're just reaching and connecting with that support and we can do this at any any time so that's a really beautiful valuable practice absolutely yeah and the image that came to my mind too is mountain pose and yoga right where Mm -hmm. both feet are solidly on the floor and tuning into that feeling of solid right connected yeah wonderful so When someone's moving into grounding, when do you suggest that they do that? Well, probably when you need, you're feeling ungrounded. (laughs) Yeah. When you're needing to do that, right? (laughs) I try to Um, ask as many stupid questions as I can. (laughs) No, that's a great question. (laughs) You know, a lot of people ask me, a lot of people ask me, like, what can I do when I'm triggered, right? What can I do when I'm feeling Mm -hmm. triggered? And what I often answer is that we want to start to just like bring our awareness into the moments earlier in the timeline, right? Where we start to say, I'm feeling annoyed. I'm feeling frustrated. And then we can, we say those things out loud, right? If you are in a situation with your teens or your toddlers or your boss or whatever, maybe you wouldn't say it with your boss, but another situation you might say out loud, (laughs) I'm starting to feel really frustrated here. Mm -hmm. And that can be like, bing, 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 bing. Like that's a, if you say it out loud, it's like a little bit of relief for you, but it's also this bell of mindfulness to say, okay, maybe, (laughs) maybe you need a break. Like maybe, maybe you need to take a break. Maybe this is where, you know, I'm feeling frustrated right now. Oh, this is a sign that I need to just kind of take a break and take care of my 
my biological stress response, right? And and that's yes. a great moment then to be grounding. When I was struggling with my young children, um, when I was a young mother, I kind of did this instinctively. I would, there's a big boulder right outside my house. I would go and I would just like put my hands on the boulder. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Side out and breathe, you know, just putting my hands on the boulder, but we can just put our hands on the ground. My a friend of mine talks about how she puts her hands on the kitchen counter, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, so we can, we can do it in those moments when we need studying. Absolutely. Yeah. In my practice, we talk a lot about uh, learning your early triggers, particularly in like couples therapy. For me, once I know a curse word pops out, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm losing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> You're talking about before then. It's like you can feel sometimes the frustration building. But for me, it's like, you know, I, I keep it together actually pretty, pretty long time. But once a curse word pops out, either in my mind or out of my mouth, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, this is the point where I actually need to take a break. But um, but I love that. Like, no, take the break earlier. I mean, you can't always do that. But but no. often you can say, no, I'm really starting to feel frustrated now, or I'm really starting to feel annoyed now. So tell you when I'm going to go ground and just let my body <laughs> cool off and we're going to come back to this conversation. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's possible for us to do this. We can, we can give ourselves time out. It's helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Time out or time in some people call it right. Yeah. Um, I love the mantras for patients that you have in your book too. Um, I help my child most when I'm calm. I Mm. love that. When the kids start yelling, I get calmer. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I love that one, right? Like, (laughs) it's interesting because I was listening. uh, I don't remember what it was. I think it was the Rich Roll podcast. He was interviewing a Navy SEAL. And they were talking about sometimes you don't know a quality that someone has until they're actually faced with a situation. Mm. So, the way that relates to this is I didn't really realize that I get extremely calm in a crisis until I got into my first car accident when I was like, uh, I think I was 22. Mm. It was my first car accident and I got extremely calm. And so for most people, when the kids start yelling, they get agitated, right? They don't get calm. (laughs) right? So it's like, um, what can they do besides the mantra of, moving into a calm state, like training their self to go into a calm state, because these aren't just qualities that happen. It's like, you can't actually train yourself for that, right? That, that was sort of. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yelling is such a hard issue for people. It really is. And um, I work a lot with it in my practice with parents. For me, I often saw it as a decision, right? Like you make a decision that I'm not going to be a yeller, but that's only the first step. Then there's all that work after that, right? Oh, for sure. And, and I think that we have to like acknowledge that we're not going to get it perfect. It's okay for us to be human. You know, it's okay for us to yell sometimes, right? Like we just don't want to be doing it every day. You know, we can cultivate a lot more calm. And I think that like in those moments, really like with there's two two kind of ways I want to approach this and one is that we want to build that muscle in the long term because you're not going to go into your equivalent of like the big game which is your your challenging situation as a parent without having practiced at all right so it's mm-hmm. not like you won't send your kid to the little league world series without having ever sent them to a practice and learning yeah. some skills they right. need to have some muscle memory and this is the same for us so that's where a mindfulness meditation habit really comes in handy because we sit and it's not like you know beautiful rainbow sparkles shoot out of our ears it's in fact that a lot of stuff comes up for us and we all sit mm-hmm. through it and we stay non-reactive and so we build a muscle of non-reactivity so i think that is really important because it's hard. It's, it's really hard for us to expect ourselves. We're kind of setting ourselves up for failure. If we just expect ourselves to react this certain way, but we don't ever practice it. Right. That's, Mm -hmm. that's kind of silly. Um, So then in the moment, you know, we can start to think about how, how we can calm the nervous system in that moment. And so a lot of times people will be like, I made a decision to be calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm calm. 
I'm calm. Oh, uh-huh. I'm losing it. You know, and so it's like <laughs> it doesn't sound very calm, right? <laughs> it's not so helpful, right? To like to like be fake calm sometimes. Sometimes we can kind of fake it till we make it, and sometimes and a lot of times it doesn't really work. And, and our kids see through it, like they kind of mm-hmm. have this incredible BS ma- meter. So instead, if we can, like I said, like just be labeling and expressing our honest feelings like as they're happening Mm -hmm. that provides a lot of relief you know dan siegel the researcher he talks about an author talks about name it to tame it and that really does provide a lot of relief to name it like i'm starting to feel frustrated i'm starting to feel really annoyed i'm getting really heated right now that can be really really helpful so we can we can start to name it to tame it if we can then take a moment say i'm getting really frustrated i need a break um, then we can go and understanding that our nervous system is say, seeing what's happening as threatening. And so we can, we can approach it via the body and via the mind. So via the body, we can take those long, slow, deep breaths, you know, because that we can't take those breaths in an emergency. Mm-hmm. So that tells our body that there's not an emergency. There's not a threat and we can calm down, right? We can, we may sigh it out like, <sighs> you know, there's actually research on that kind of like dramatic loud sigh. Mm-hmm. And it shows that it really does change that brain's chemistry, which is really cool. And we can shake it out. You can literally, because your body's nervous system has put, you know, taken energy away from like your rest and digest response and moved it into your tightening your muscles and making your heartbeat and your extremities to act. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's like a energy, right. There's a physical energy there that you can't just like turn off on and off like a switch. You actually need to like move it out of your body. And there's in our, on our bookshelf, we have this great book titled why zebras don't get ulcers. And Mm -hmm. I think it's, I love this, like my favorite book title. And you think about the zebra on the Savannah who's like chased by a lion. Like why isn't that zebra like totally stressed out? like yeah. the rest of their life, right? But what they do and what a lot of mammals do bes- besides human and humans do some sometimes, but we're sort of too caught up in our own thinking to do it sometimes is that we just like shake, they shake, like they shake their yes. whole bodies, like they shake their heads, their arms. And that's literally just releasing the energy, right? So you, those are some things we can do via the body. And then via the mind, we can use some of those mantras to help ourselves. Like, tell yourself like, I'm safe. This is not, you know, this isn't, Mm -hmm. this is not an emergency. I'm safe. Right. Because we need to tell our nervous system that we're safe. It's okay. Right. Or I'm helping my child. Um, and I love that. That's a great book. Don't get ulcers. (laughs) (laughs) And yet you do see that. And if you ever had a dog, they shake all the time, Yes, right. They shake it out and it's a trauma response as well the shaking. And Mm -hmm. so it's like, um, I was working with a firefighter one time and just talking about this, trying to get somebody to stop shaking. And I was like, Oh, if I could teach you one thing, don't get them to stop shaking, let them shake, like put a blanket around them, you know, but that's a trauma response to shake it out. But I love using it as a conscious kind of release, like, Oh, I can shake here. And I can see little kids like joining you in that, right? Like, let's shake this out. (laughs) Right? Yeah, I can really yeah. just see the dance happening um, and the movement towards perhaps happiness there. Um, and I also have a kind of like a when all else fails. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, and I actually used this last year. Uh, I discovered a new trigger for me, which was uh, after a movie night, my nine year, then nine year old, she laughed at me when uh-huh. it was time for bed. And I was like, <laughs> and so I at that moment I I yelled but I yelled skillfully so this is like the all if all oh let's hear I want to hear what a yell skillfully is I just yelled (laughs) I'm really angry right now (laughs) I slammed the door and walked outside (laughs) I I had to walk up and down the street like for 20 minutes to cool off on that one but (laughs) it was Uh like you know, it's instead of like saying you're a ba 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 ba, you yeah. know, you're just like owning your feelings. Yes, so. absolutely, yeah. great. Well, do you, at being a 
an HSP, highly sensitive person, mm. do you feel like parenting is harder for you than someone who's not? I don't know. I mean, I think that we all have our own challenges mm -hmm. that, you know, and our kids quickly find those challenges. I, it's to feel all the things um, can be really hard. Definitely. <laughs> I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. But what is, what's an incredible benefit of it is that if you're a highly sensitive person, you have to learn how to take care of your difficult feelings. You have to learn how to offer yourself compassion, how to move through these things, right? You, you have to learn that stuff because <laughs> otherwise you'll just be a puddle on the floor. So yes, miserable. I mean, yeah. I met, I'm an HSP too. It took me a long time to figure it out. They didn't really talk about that when I was younger. I just knew that I needed the whole house to be quiet so I could read, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> or that, you know, I could not wear certain fashions. I could not is the feeling in my body, you know, like I had yeah. to be comfortable, right? But um, noise and light and sound and all kinds of stuff. But um yeah, so it, I, I do think it's harder because we tend to be empathetic. You know, like the, I think our kids need like a little bit of like, um, you know, more love, less care <laughs> in such a way that I mean mm -hmm. that in such a way that like we need to like detach just a little from them. Like it's they have their own lives and we can love them so much, but we don't need to. Um, take on all their problems as our own. They're going to have their feelings and we need to be able to separate from our kids a little and let them have their own yeah. lives and let them have their own feelings. I don't know. I come from my own experience. So it's, it's hard mm -hmm. to say whether, you know, for me, I feel like these things have become teachers and I'm glad I learned the lessons when I did. I think it would be a shame to not learn them until later. Right. Like I'm glad I learned those lessons when I did. And, oh uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to have not not learned them to later, you know, because the the lessons about how to take care of our difficult feelings are, you know, it's so vital to being human. I feel like if there's, you know, I know I'm part of like a revolution and an evolution in the way that we parent and mm -hmm. have relationships with our, our kids. And if this is one thing this revolution and evolution can do is like help people like give us all some knowledge and some acceptance that we're all going to have like, you know, anxiety, aggression, anger, sadness, doubt, fear, all of these things. And we can take care of them and not shame and blame ourselves for having them. Like that's a powerful, powerful transformation. Absolutely. Yes. Like those feelings are part of the human experience. There's not a whole lot of ways around them. But um, yes. if we can learn to recognize them and take care of them, then it's better for us and our kids, the relationship we're yeah. developing with them. We're hoping to for develop, the whole I world. Say. I mean, all mm -hmm. the difficulties in the world can stem. I mean, practically could like stem to like people not being able to take care of their difficult feelings. Yeah. And you think about like every school shooting, every you know, all the like problems, you know, what's in the macro levels and the uh, micro levels in the macro level. And, and yes. I really see that like at, when we are transforming our parenting, we're, tr you know, all of us like in our homes, all, all over the world, like we're starting to transform the way humans interact with each other and uh, completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Interact with each other. Yeah. It starts with yourself right? Like interact yes. with yourself first, figure out how to handle these difficult feelings, um, how to move through them, how to recognize them and then move through them so that, yeah, they're not taken out on other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whether that person is like your sibling or partner or a random stranger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And you know, and I think also about like in the what's in the the micro levels and the macro level, like in our families, like the old method was authoritarian generally, right? Like do as I say, because I say, and if you don't do as I say, I will use power to make you hurt in some way, right? And yeah. in the family level, like if we can start to say, 
okay, if we have conflicts, you have some needs and I have some needs and we can resolve our conflicts by looking at how we can meet everybody's needs. If we can imagine that in the macro level, like that's an amazing transformation for the whole human race. Right. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I, I love seeing it that way. I love that, um, you know, underlying foundational perspective. I really do like this is changing the world and how we interact in the world. This isn't just for my benefit or your benefit. It's change in the world in a global perspective. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. So where can people find you? Uh, you can find everything at mindfulmamamentor.com. And I have the Mindful Mama podcast there. You're a podcast listener. You can mm-hmm. check it out anywhere podcasts are. And and Raising Good Humans is there. It's also on audiobook. So um, fantastic. And you offer a membership community and a, a course? Yes. So um, I teach mindful parenting. And there's like hundreds of families from all around the world which is so cool. So personally, it's funny because I'm an author, but I find it hard to just like read a book and do something like we need more support. We need to be able to ask questions. We need other people around us who are doing the same thing, you know, particularly with parenting. We don't always have the local village right now, or exactly. We can't see the local village right now, (laughs) but we have the non-local village that can absolutely help us in communities like this that that pop up and give you ideas and support and all of this. Yeah. 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 Your, your local village, like I have mindful parenting members um, who are like in local villages where they're just teaching, you know, spare the rod and spoil a child. And that's like, not what we want, right? Like that's not the support that they want. That may be their local experience. I actually do doing now a mindful parenting teacher training, which is so cool. So I have people in like, in Texas and I've our, our first certified teacher is like in Montana and you know, there's going to be one in Aus- Australia. It's like they're creating that, you know, they're starting to create that local vi- village too, which is so cool, but we need each other. Like we can't just do this in a vacuum. It's so, it makes it so much harder, right? Like, is, you absolutely. know, we need that support. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You need people to talk things over with or toss out ideas or say this happened or, you know, my kid did refuse to go to school and this is what happened. And how do I handle that better? Yeah, right. Because yeah. it's going to happen again. Right. Yeah. Like, it usually doesn't just happen once. Yeah. Um, this is true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really just enjoyed your experience and wisdom that you shared with us. Oh, thank you so much. It's been really a pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You make it so easy. Uh, So thank you very much. truly enjoyed today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you in helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace.